Representative Greer. Is excused. She's getting on as well. Representative Jennings. Representative McGuire. Present. Representative Olson. Here. Representative Summers. Here. Representative Washett. Here. Representative Wilson. Here. Representative Yen. Here. Representative Swanitzer. Here. And Speaker Barlow. Here. So we got a couple of members that are still getting logged in. Here's Chairman Greer. Present. Oh, I'm sorry. And Representative Jennings. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. I did read the fine print on the webinar stuff. Right. Name Jennings is next door to you. Ray? Yeah, he's on the floor here. They're they're we're trying to work on it. So okay, thank you. You got to create a password the way we're doing it, so it's kind of a a weird deal. So thank you. No worries. Thank you. Um, so members, uh, I'm gonna get rid of these members. Um, our task is pretty straightforward tonight. What we have is um, amendments to the House rules for our consideration. And I think that the, the process is, is that we present the amendments, we discuss it by amendment by amendment. We will um, dispose of them either to uh, recommend their adoption to the body or reject their adoption because, and then take a, 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 a uh, mass amendment, I guess, as you will, to the body of all those that we approve. If an amendment is failed by this group, that does not mean there couldn't be an amendment from the floor, the same as, or anything else. So um, I think if, if everybody's, are we all on the same page, that that's the appropriate approach. Um, Ms. Landry's done this many times, Chief Clerk, is that how you would see it um, being done as well? Okay. So um, I'm going to maybe dispense. Uh, yes, Representative Washington. <clears throat> Point of order, uh, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned before we got started about proxy voting. And as I read Rule 5 3, um, in standing committees, we can only have a proxy if we're absent to attend another legislative meeting. Is that correct? And is that, that the way we're going to follow the rules um, for proxy voting? Um, I, I guess I'm not, I don't have the, I don't have my rule book right in front of me. I think we've, um, done it more liberally than that in the past and done it more liberally, even in the body. I mean, with our standing committee members meetings, um, certainly, and I, like I said, I, I'm sorry, we're talking about the rules committee and I don't have my rules in my lap. I apologize. <laughs> They're up on the dais. Um, but, um, so I guess we can have that discussion first. There's only one one person that left the proxy, and that was Representative um, Brown. He had a um, I don't know, was it medical or he had something he had to attend to, and he was gone all of the afternoon. So he he just left the proxy on those. So we can we can see if the uh, if his votes make a difference or not. Of course, that makes a uh, makes a difference as well. Uh, but I think for now, let's just proceed like um, um, we would accept them. And we can discuss it if we feel differently. Oh, thanks. And I've got rules. Thank you, Representative Larson Dan. <coughs> All right. Um, any 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 other committee business we need to attend to before we do this, Ms. Landry or Chief Clerk? Nope. Okay. So I'm just going to go down. The first rule um, is is a is one that came with the meeting notice. This is a rule 1.4. This is a repealer of 1.4 and this as you will recall this is when we were in the Jonas Center we uh, named that the capital and use that as the state capital or capital um, so this is a motion to basically clean up our house rules by removing this so um, is there any dis any any discussion before we uh, dispense with this one representative Summers Mr. Chairman, is this uh, one of the ones in uh, Pam's email? 
Yes, it is. It, they don't have a number. So what is the name of the, the document that we're supposed to open? Well, it's, it's, the, it's rule 1-4 and it's procedural and parliamentary authority. Point of order, Mr. Chairman, I believe on your email, it's called repeal temporary legislative facilities. Yep, thank you. No point of order there, just help clarify what we need to do, what we need to look at. Repeal of legislative, temporary legislative facilities. So then Mr. Speaker, uh, I move um, the repeal of temporary legislative facilities. So this is, a, there's a motion to repeal 1-4. There's a second by Conley. Any discussion on this? Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. All those opposed? Motion is carried. The next one is, and if somebody has the name of it on the, on the uh, file, this is for 14-5 and 15-5, and this is actually spelling errors in our current rules under the House Journal and Records for, um, 14, Rule 14. Does everybody have that before you? It's to uh, correctly spell supersede with supersede with an S and device with a C instead of device. So move, Mr. Chairman. There's a motion to um, recommend the adoption of these amendments. Is there a second? Second by Wilson. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. All those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. So those were cleanup bills. The next one is a recommendation for rule 4-3 and 4-6. And um, these are the introduction and referral of bills. And um, Chairman Zwanitzer, what would it be called? Um, document. Uh, on you, Chairman. It's called Bill Jacket Approval, Mr. Chairman. Bill Jacket Approval, thank you. So this one is uh, uh, brought to me by the chief clerk and it really goes to, as you know, when you have sponsored a bill and approved it through LSO on that first day or the first couple of days, um, folks are chasing you around, staff is chasing you around to get your signature on the bill, get it on the, on the envelope, on the bill jacket. And so what, what the proposal is here is to strike the signature and just go with name. So once you approve it with LSO, that's the last action you have to you don't have to sign it later. And then the second one is, uh, they're both have to do with the signing of the jacket. So once it's approved with LSO and you've hit your extra net button or you've sent your email um, signifying your approval, there's no subsequent step. Because we, we, this, when this rule was put into place, we didn't have you know, some of the techniques we're using to approve bills. Um, we were doing them, you know, everybody was writing the bills and they were you know, signing everything and all that. So this is just try to maybe take out one, I, I think, marginally necessary step. That does not mean that you can't have additional sponsors sign on to the bill that would be added at crossover. Is that correct, Chief Clerk? Yes, um, Mr. Chairman, that is correct. And one way that we thought would be an easy way to do it is that the members could run the most current copy of the bill, and that would be, of course, off of the website, they would take that bill around and have it signed, bring that back to the chief clerks, and then we would place, I would place that into the bill jacket. Then when it went for in grossing, or grossing uh, to, to the other body, those names would be added on. If it's not engrossed, those names would be added on, of course, then when it, if it became law, when it went to the Enrolled Act. All right, further, any discussion? Representative Conley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I'm a little unclear about 
honestly, what the chief clerk just said, if we remain in a virtual session. So what, what's going on now and how do we get those? Well, there's really no individual level bills right now. So that really isn't an issue. But what if we continue virtually in March because you're still talking about physical signatures. Okay, so first of all, I brought up the second issue, which was additional signatures, co-sponsors to bill. That is not really germane to this amendment. I just wanted to make sure that folks knew this is for the sponsorship signature, not for additional signatures. So I apologize that I may have confused that, but this is for um, additional uh, this is not for additional, this is just for the sponsorship. And we're just trying to eliminate that physical contact where Chief Clerk's got to get a bill before it can be introduced and read in, quite honestly, before the speaker can even handle the bill. And sometimes, as you might imagine, that takes several days to get all those signatures when we're in person, when we're in person. So I apologize if I muddied that. Uh, Representative Olson, and then I saw Greer's hand go up. Yeah. Representative Olson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So my, my question is to 4-3 then, because I understand what it would do in a virtual session, right? Because now our name is on the jacket instead of our signature, I suppose. But I'm trying to understand what, maybe it's been too long since I've seen a bill jacket, because I'm trying to understand what that what that really does in terms of a rule, because doesn't the bill jacket already have the name of the bill and the name of the sponsor typed on it? Yeah, so it's already gonna be there. So what we normally do is sign the jacket. So we're, we're just saying the rule is exactly what the bill jacket already looks like. But I guess that's a little confusing to me because the signature is how I know as a representative that I approved the bill jacket for introduction so how do we, does that, is that where 4-6 ties in then because there'll be some kind of an email or something that the chief clerk would have that, that we could go back and say, no, you actually did approve it? So the, um, and I'll let the chief clerk, um, I'll, I'll take a couple more comments and then Representative Greer, and then we'll, we'll cut it to yeah, so Mr. Speaker, I, and I, I kind of like this change because I, I could see, uh, I'd forget to go up and sign my bill jackets. And so, uh, the chief clerk's trying to chase me down. They've got pile, her staff, they've all got piles of bills up there. And I'll just tell you in my mind, when I pushed the button uh, that approved my bill and it comes back on the extranet and says it's numbered for introduction, then I'm not thinking about it anymore. And I think that rule just takes us, this rule change just takes us there. Um, I don't know, um, Representative Summers? Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman, I just I'd like to move those those changes. So I'd like to move these two rule changes. All right. So there's a motion. There's a second. Second by Greer. All right. Now I guess we can have more discussion. We, I wanted to kind of give an explanation, and I apologize before we got there. Um, any discussion on this? Any discussion? We could talk about weeds, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Well, thank you, Chairman Greer. I think we will be speaking much of weed and weeds. All right, any, uh, any further discussion, any real discussion? All those in favor of the rule, uh, the change to 4-3 and 4-6, please raise your hands. Thank you, all those opposed? Thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go with Representative Zwanitzer's next because he's going to have to depart at seven o'clock. He has a family celebration. So I'll just uh, do him that small courtesy because he was uh, let me know about that. Um, so Representative Zwanitzer, um, if you'd like to present your rule, please. Suggest. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, give me about five seconds here to pull it up. I wasn't totally prepared. Um, and I know that uh, Representative Gray has similar um, on the same topic. So what uh, my amendment does is repeals the budget amendment roll call, as you can see, um, in 11.3 and 12.4. So let me give you uh, just my thinking, and then I'm happy to amend it or discuss it as appropriate. 
um, as all of you, because there's no freshman to remember um, for the about, I think 10 years now, 11 years, um, we have had a requirement that every time we add money, uh, an appropriation to the budget, we take a roll call vote. Um, the way the wording is, it doesn't matter if we are decreasing or increasing the budget. And so we've had many times, especially last year, we had a unanimous vote to take money out of the budget and everybody cheered, but we still had to go through the two minute and 18 second roll call. That's what it was averaged out last year. Um, and it seemed really pointless to me when there was no division, everybody was in agreement on a certain budget amendment, but it did affect funds. So then I thought, well, I was just gonna take out the, any decrease in funds. Um, and then if there was an increase in funds, a member could still ask but we already have that rule covered that at any time on a second or third reading amendment, because we no longer allow committee of the whole amendments to the budget, that any two members can already ask for the eyes and nose to be called. And so that didn't seem to make sense um, to force us to do it um, when anybody can already do it with two members and two members seems pretty safe to me. Um, that way we don't get that one guy on every budget amendment asking us to do the eyes and nose. So, um, I was here and we put it in. I wasn't a big fan of it. Um, it was, I think, a political game. Some people were playing to hold our feet to the fire. And then, um, for better or worse, a lot of the lobbying groups and national organizations take a lot of those votes. And in some cases, that's great um, to be used on our whatever scoring ranking. I just, I guess I'd like to think at this point, we're adults. We've been elected. We don't need to do a roll call to be on, on record. Um, for an I or no on a budget amendment, more so than any other bill or amendment to a bill. If somebody wants to still call the roll call on I and call for the eyes and nose, they're perfectly welcome to do that. But having to do this on every budget amendment, as all of you know, takes up considerable time and we go late in the night every year and it just seemed um, not appropriate anymore. So that's my appeal, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Um, you want to just make no, let's, any 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 discussion, and I we'll go with Representative Gray has a couple, of, and I and I sorry I haven't taken time to see how closely they are, but they're 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 a little bit different, so we won't we won't try to intermix them. Um, so any any other questions you anybody might have for the chairman's monitor, Representative Greer. I, I guess. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, and, I, and uh, as with Chairman Zwanser, we were around when this rule came in, and and it's fine. I just um, I don't have a problem uh, just jumping right to a roll call on an increase to the budget. Um, that that means then that one or two members that want to do that, which is their absolute right, don't have to jump up every time and make the motion and get sneered at or, or whatever the case may be. We just do it as a matter of course. I agree that doing it on a decrease in the budget doesn't make much sense. So I don't know. I, I, uh, I'm, further, my thoughts. further discussion. I know there's not a motion, but let's just have a little discussion because it'll help prepare us for the next couple of amendments. Representative Zwanser. And I would say, as many of you know, sometimes it is a, an eight to 52 vote um, and it does seem just, it's just lengthy and takes up time and budget day is so long. So um, a fallback position would be every time an increase in the budget um, or any time it's not unanimous. I, I, I just think there are maybe were probably four or five budget amendments on second and third last year that were unanimous. Um, and I don't know how to put that in the rule that we don't have to do a roll call if it's unanimous, but we could try something like that. I just, yeah, it gets tiresome and lengthy and seems pointless um, on, you know, about 10% of the budget amendments. So if anybody has a better suggestion um, to loosen up the requirements, I know uh, Representative Gray has some that might increase, but I'd be happy to go the other way. All right, so we so we have a suggested uh, amendment here. Would somebody like to um, move the amendment or, or bring a different amendment uh, modify this amendment in some way. Members, Representative Washington. I guess I would move to amend uh, the proposed rule change um, so that 11-3 uh, 
would read, would just delete the word or decreases. So, Mr. Chairman, we haven't had a motion on the rule right. to so have I, an amendment. Yeah, fair enough. Um, fair enough. So the motion that the representatives wanted, Sir Chairman wanted to, is a repeal of both of those. So I'm trying to, and representatives wanted to, was willing to take some suggestions about a mid ground or something else. So I'm just trying to work through that before we take a motion. Um, so well, representatives wanted, sir? I'd be happy to move my amendment, Mr. Speaker, and then I'd be very happy and open to amendments. Okay, so uh, is there a second on the, on the move? Okay, there's a second by Summers. All right, so, um, so this is a repeal. Um, so we'd have to, well, I just, we have to just vote up a repeal one way or the other, right? Yeah, I don't think we can. I don't think we can do anything within the language of a repeal. Anybody have a different thought on that? I, I guess, Mr. Question. Speaker. Go ahead, Chairman Greer. I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, you know, I'd look at as Representative Zwanser's wanting to strike all this language in the amendment by Representative Washington to insert it all except for two words. Fair enough. Fair enough. Is there an amendment to the amendment? to the motion. Representative Washington, is that a fair amendment for you? I believe the country lawyer stated it pretty clearly. All right. Uh, I see Representative Jennings. Well, I have a question here. I, oh, I don't... Do I, have a, go ahead. do I have a second on that? Second. Go on, sir. Thank you. I apologize. Representative Jennings? Yeah, I have a question on this. I, I understand the uh, if it's a unanimous vote, why would we need a roll call? And I'm, I'm absolutely okay with that, I think. But the decrease, I think there, there could be reasons that people would want to see, you know, um, why did you pull funding? Why did you vote for pulling funding from my organization or something? And so I, I guess I have a little more question to that part. If, if Representative Zwaner, sir, could uh, address that. So I think this is actually Representative Washett's motion, um, if he'd like to, uh, so to reinsert the language without the two or decreases? Well, I, I think the option still occurs that anybody can still call, right, for a, a roll call. And so this is just getting rid of the automatic aspect of it. Thank you, Representative Yin. Sorry, and then Madam Minority Floor Leader. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll cede my time to Madam Minority Floor Leader. Minority Floor Leader Conway. You don't have to seed or supersede. Yeah, right. You could you could filibuster if you wanted to, Mike. Um, so I, I'm kind of mixed here. Uh, I want to go back actually to, to Representative Jennings' kind of comment regarding decreases could be as relevant as increases. And let's just say as a as an example, I had a decrease that eliminated the Department of Corrections. Right, something along those lines. I think people, lots of people might want to know what that vote looks like. But that being said, so that's my, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, an increase or a decrease. I think that they could be equally as interesting, honestly, to some people to know what that vote count is. So I'm honestly more in favor of Representative Zwanitzer's original motion. Let's just get rid of them. Um, and then you could call for the, the votes because we do in fact spend a lot of time on votes on that last day. Um, so just my two cents at this point. All right, so we're on the amendment to the amendment which reinserted all the language except or decrease in the two rules. We're on the amendment to the amendment. Mm -hmm. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment. Representative Yen, you're back in the game. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so I, I think I would agree with the minority floor leader in that um, I, there are good reasons to get the eyes and nose for an increase and there are good reasons to get the eyes and nose for a decrease, but there are also good reasons to, to not um, use up the time uh, that is precious discussion time, productive discussion time that we could use on other amendments, getting eyes and nose for things that are uncontroversial. Um, so I, I, I would, speak against the amendment and uh, say that it, it's, it is uh, the member's right in, in um, rule to have 
two members stand up and ask for the eyes and nose. And I, I don't think that's too much of an ask um, for doing it either uh, in either way, whether it, it succeeds or it fails. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. All right, thank you. Any more discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Reinserting all the languages except word decreases. Further discussion, further discussion on the amendment? Question. All those are in favor of the amendment to the amendment, please raise your hand. All those, in, all those opposed? Okay, the, the amendment has failed. The amendment to the amendment has failed. We're back on the original amendment to repeal. Discussion on the amendment. Question. Oh. Uh, nope, I've got Representative Gray. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm opposed to this. I just, I lean towards transparency. Um, usually we cover those second, third readings. We get here and it's all gonna be one day anyway. So um, the difference between adjourning at 8.20 versus 8 p.m. versus, you know, having that, that transparency there, I just, I think it outweighs. And, um, you know, I, some of you remember, you know, I, I came in one day and, you know, I had like eight amendments I had draft. I'm like, well, if we're not going to, you know, have some, I, I've, we've worked a lot of time on these amendments. And, and if I can't go back to my people and say, hey, here's where I think maybe in the future I can work with someone, talk with someone, you know, I'm not, I'm not X man here. You know, I can't do laser vision when people are standing. I can't go up and take a photo. People be upset with that um, when we're doing standing divisions. The recorded vote is the only way to really understand where the body is at so that you can improve in the future and talk to them and say, hey, how can we improve this? What were you thinking here? And, and how, do we, how do we get better? And so I, I just lean towards more recorded votes. I, I, I think eliminating this is, is uh, a, a mistake and um, I'm, I'm gonna urge a no vote, so thank you. Okay, further discussion on the amendment, uh, Rep. Chairman Olson. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've been kind of stewing this one over since it came through my email and trying to figure out where I'd land and this discussion has been really helpful. I could probably go either way on it. I, I def, I'm definitely tracking with Representative Gray on, on transparency. And I, I think I'm gonna support this um, rule at the end of the day because, it, you know, and I'll, I'll call for the eyes and nays when I need it. And I'll, I'll take a beating if I call for it too much, I suppose, from my colleagues and they get tired of it. But I really think that's the, that's the saving grace at the end of the day. If we want to track a vote, we have the, we have the ability to by calling the eyes and the nays. And I think if we didn't, if that were more cumbersome, if it, if it required something more than a second, um, I would want this to be mandatory. Um, I, I, I don't know that it's, uh, other than, than cutting into our time deeply, um, I don't know that it's caused a whole lot of harm or good either way. I don't know that anything really good that I can track, in, at least in my time, that has come from, from these votes. Um, um, you know, but I, I, I support the principle of transparency. So I think I'm gonna support this rule um, as long as we still have the ability to call the eyes and the nays. I think I feel pretty comfortable with that. Thank you. Further Thank you for the discussion. Uh, Representative Zwanser and then Representative Gray. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And there's a lot of positives, but we we didn't talk about maybe the dark side of legislating. And there have been some cases, in my opinion, and I don't want to assume intentions, but where certain budget amendments were brought to the floor, no realistic expectation of passage, but merely to get a vote on a certain issue that would be used for political or campaign purposes. And I know we're all subject to that in life, but sometimes it felt like it was so blatant um, to just be disparaging to the institution. And so, and maybe I just took some of them personally, um, but there are some times where I didn't think amendments were shopped at all. Um, certain four people or so brought it, knowing it was gonna be a tough vote, forcing us all to be on the record for something that was never gonna pass. Um, for political purposes, which weren't beneficial. So I think in those cases where people really want to do that, they can stand up and say, I'm going to put myself out there and force my colleagues uh, to put you know, their votes in the line. And um, that is the will of the body and the body will correct that 
if someone does it over and over and over for potentially nefarious purposes. Thanks. Thank you for the discussion. I saw Representative Gray's hand. Anyone else? Go ahead, Representative Gray. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I uh, have worked with the chairman, the corporations on a lot of different things. I, I just, I really reject some of the comments. Yeah, I want to push back on those. I mean, I think uh, when you try to go after people, you know, speculate on people's motives, it, it's very, uh, it's, it's a troubled path. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we work a lot of time on these amendments and, you know, I ask, I, I'm not, I can't get up there. Someone can't get up there and, and be like X-Man and remember uh, the, how people stood. I mean, it's, it's just kind of, frankly, it's not deliberative. It's, it's not, uh, it's one of, I think the most, the, the parts of the, this body that I would change the most is I, I would add more recorded votes and it's not about, uh, you know, it's not about motive. It's about a deliberative process. When I talk to someone and I, I talk to a constituent about something I brought and they or an amendment and it wasn't recorded and I can't tell them, you know, I can give them the number based on my memory, but I can't tell them, you know, what the path would be, who I could talk to, uh, what were some of the concerns. I mean, the tremendous amount of staff time and, and member time that we put into these I, I just think the way we dispense with them without having a recording for our elected representatives, I just think is really uh, a bad move. And you think about this budget, I mean, it's an important budget. It really is. And uh, to totally eliminate the recorded votes, I mean, uh, and, and, and I know I see the shaking heads. Well, they say, well, someone can bring it. I mean, um, I came in one time and said, I'm going to do it on every single one I brought. And, um, you know, I don't want to get too much in the past. The chairman of corporations submitted a thing in the journal kind of, uh, and I remember it. It was an interesting uh, thing. And so there is a, uh, a pressure there. And so now we're going to eliminate it on a key budget. I mean, I, and I'll never forget that day. I'll, I'll never forget it. I mean, and, and, you know, we move forward and everything, but the idea that, um, Someone's just going to call. I mean, I, I'm not afraid, but at the end of the day, these should be automatically recorded. And, and especially when there's an increase and decrease on the budget. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Representative McGuire. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and this is in no way, shape, or uh, to be taken at a personal level, but uh, there are you know, different ways that a legislative body can move forward. And sometimes there are some intangibles and sometimes a body just gets moving forward and uh, the speaker or the, uh, the person who's running the, the meeting gets a feeling and, the, and there's a momentum. And so I'm just putting it out that there are different ways that legislation can work and work effectively. And sometimes it's not always with a recorded vote. Sometimes it's very effective to have voice votes and to let the body build a momentum and to move forward. And, and I'm just putting that out there and I don't mean, I don't want it to be taken personally by anybody. It's not an attack. It's just an observation that sometimes things can work either way. So I, I hope that people will not take that as a personal and just, just take it for what it is. Thank you. Further discussion? Further, by Representative Greg, my apologies. Representative Greg. Well, I, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think our, uh, in response to that previous point, I, I think our current rules recognize that. I mean, the vast majority of our amendments are not recorded. Um, any amendment on a regular bill, second and third reading, um, it would have to be the member calling for the eyes and nose. This is on the budget that the, there's been a carve out where um, on an increase or a decrease, and it has to pass, by the way. So like when I came in with all these decreases, they had to pass in order for it to report. That's why, that's why I called them because none of them were going to pass <laughs> because uh, that was just the 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 sentiment of the body that day. 
And I always thought that disparity was a little bit of an issue, but our rules are so far the other way where um, almost none of our amendments are recorded, none of them. And now it is gonna be pretty much none of them unless a member does it. And you know, I can think back to last session, it was probably done four times, I think last year, total uh, by members, I'd say it's in that range. Um, total the entire session outside of the budget. Um, this is a huge change and, and I'd really, really urge a, a no vote. Um, thank you. Thank you, further discussion? Further discussion, we're back on the original motion. Further discussion, the repeal of, excuse me, let's change my page, 11-3 and 12-4. Back on the motion. All right, we're voting on the motion to repeal 11-3, 12-4. All those in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Thank you. All those opposed? Chair votes no. The, um, the motion has failed. The amendment has failed. We seem to be missing somebody. Who else are we missing besides Representative Brown? Mr. Speaker. Yes. Uh, just Mr. Speaker, I just want to explain my vote on the last um, sure. rule. Please proceed. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I get really tired of the showmanship that's created by call, the call for the eyes and the nose. I think it's uh, oftentimes inappropriate um, to your colleagues. But on the budget, it's different. On the budget, we are making a conscious decision to increase or decrease the budget. When we're doing that, I think our vote should be recorded. And I think for all the reasons the people said on both sides, if we're, if we're willing to slash somebody's budget, we should be held accountable for that. If we're willing to increase the budget, we should be held accountable for that. I have far less concern with that than uh, showmanship on other bills and other calls for the eyes and the nose, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. So um, do we, there, was, there was a suggestion about the unanimous component, um, if there was no objection. So I don't know, um, and I know we've dispensed with this motion, but does anybody want to um, entertain that at all or think about it some more, maybe bring something from the floor? Um, anybody have any thoughts on that? If not, we'll, go, we'll, we'll dispense with this entirely and go on to Representative Gray's um, amendments next. Further discussion? No? All right. Thank you. Representative Gray, you've got, uh, I have three before me. Is that accurate? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, but which one would you like to start with? Um, <coughs> just pull up the email, um, Mr. Speaker. Let's start with the first one in the email, please. Uh, the budget amendment. Uh, um, I've got two that have budget amendments. I have uh, two different language. One has a little more language than the other in 11.3b. They both have new language, 11.3b. So which one, um, the longer version or the shorter version? This would be 11.3b, amendments to budget bill. Um, it shall not be in order for the House to consider okay. any amendment to the mere budget bill. Okay, does everybody have that? Um, would you like to give a, a brief overview and take any questions and then move the amendment, or you can move the amendment if you'd like, and then we can discuss it as we go. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I'll move the amendment. Okay, is there a second? Representative Jennings, second it. Wilson, second it. Okay, we've got a second. Representative Gray, go ahead and please explain your amendment. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the first two uh, kind of go together. One is kind of stronger than the other. Um, I'm starting with the stronger one. This is kind of off of the federal concept of pay as you go, which is that um, we get a base budget. And, it, you know, I, I remember back to 2017 seeing amendments that would have a pay for where if there's an increase, there would be a corresponding decrease. And those ones would almost never pass when you would have to think about those trade-offs. 
Whereas if it's just an increase, those, those generally do pass on, on the budget reading. And I think it's important for us to think about those trade-offs. And yes, it allows the appropriations committee to set a base budget. And I know that'll be the argument um, against it. But um, I think in these budget difficulties, I think we, we need to think about those trade-offs rather than just having a bunch of increases. Um, so this would require a corresponding decrease. So, um, you know, if there's like a $200,000 increase to budget X, there would be, need to be a $200,000 decrease to, and you could spread it out across other areas. And I think this is, uh, you know, thinking about the trade-offs and not just the idea that there's just money floating out there, um, which I, 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 I'm afraid sometimes on second, third reading on the budget, I think it, we, get, we move too much in that direction. Uh, no offense meant, um, but that's what the amendment does um, and it's moved. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any discussion on the amendment? Representative Wilson, Chairman Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman, um, and I'm I'm going to bring something up, and I'm I haven't really contemplated language to f address my concern, so I apologize for that. But I, I actually have found over the last few years that something that actually annoys me even more than this, <laughs> or maybe as much, is when people, let's say, uh, you know, switch from uh, general fund to water too, or from general fund to tobacco trust fund or something. And, you know, kind of heedlessly pile on, well, we don't, we can take $2 million out of tobacco funds instead. And then that's totally unbalanced. So as I say, I, I haven't, because I didn't look at these, you know, during the day, I don't, I'm not sure if I want if I would just say, take out the words Henry general fund without an offsetting decrease. I, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I'm not sure. So I just bring that up for discussion, but I, I find that um, that's almost more of a problem than the general fund issue because people tend to think of that. But I think that people who are not, I, anyway, I'll just stop there. <laughs> that's my discussion. Uh, Representative, Representative Yen, Representative Conley, and then back to Representative Gay. Great. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think also Representative Harshman is in the waiting room with his hands up, so maybe he has public comment on this if you would like to take it. Um, I will we'll, say... Go ahead. We'll finish the committee discussion, and then we'll take public comment. Thank you. Sure. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I will say I'm, I'm not sure, and maybe this is a question for the bringer of the amendment, um, if he's contemplated how much power this grants the appropriation committee, because once they set a general fund budget number in the bill, it becomes unchangeable by us as the body. And I, I don't know if that is ideally what we want to do to make the body essentially subservient to the appropriations committee on how much money we're, we're able to spend. And, and please correct me if I'm wrong. And I really do hope that I'm wrong in that, in that matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Representative Conley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just have a general comment to start with, and I do understand that we are in a budget crisis, and honestly, everything that we think about is increasing expenditures. However, that being said, I honestly have a hard time thinking about increases to the budget as per se negative all the time. I think that it's our obligation as a legislature to fund the needed services in the state. And that's a good thing, that's our job. And so it concerns me that we're always talking about decreases mm -hmm. and what to do about it. And so with this one here, it occurred to me that what if we went in the other direction as well? And if there was any decrease, if someone had a decrease, well, then you had to put it someplace else. And so that would be my suggestion to, to the bringer that if you're going to do it one direction, you might do it in the other direction as well. But my, so I, I will not vote for this. So I will be on and against it. But I do want us to think about honestly, our obligations to fund the state. Thank you. I have uh, Chairman Greer and then Chairman Olson. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, I like the concept here, but it, th this is my concern as expressed by Representative Yan, and no, he was not wrong on this. You would give all of the power to the JAC. Um, and, and, and everyone knows I have always tried to stand with our JAC and defend the budget and try to help them out best I can. Um, but there are times where the body makes a policy decision and overrides that base budget. And this would really hamper that. So that's my concern with it. I like the concept, but I do have a great concern with it. Represent, uh, Chairman Olson. Yep. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm more curious on what this would look like with the other body. So, you know, if it only applies to our body, um, you know, what, what then happens when, and maybe that's just kind of a hole in the process, what then happens when amendments are made in the other body and then it comes over to us? Um, I suppose those aren't amendments that we're, vote, we're voting on at that point. So I guess we could vote on those increases from the, from the other body. So I think that could, that could really, it would create a very interesting dynamic. I think a rule for that reason, I would I think a rule like this, you would want to be a mirror rule. Um, I don't know that it gives any power to the Senate unless we're worried about them increasing as a, you know, as opposed to the power the J or the JAC gets in setting a base budget. But I do think it creates an, an unparalleled, um, you know, power struggle between the House and the Senate where the, where the Senate would be allowed to do such a thing, but not the House. It's very interesting to me. Um, so I don't know if if the bringers thought that through, and maybe he could speak a little um, a little to that. It'd be helpful. Uh, thank you, Representative Gray. Do you want to respond to anything? And then I see Representative Summers has his hand up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, yeah, I would like to respond to those. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, the representative Yun's comment is is he was kind of cutting out. Sorry, I've internet connection has been in and out a little bit on the floor, but. Um, yeah, I mean, appropriations would set the base budget, but I, I would say appropriations already has a lot of power. I mean, to and this kind of gets into my response to um, uh, Representative Conley's comment is that, you know, I think the four years I've been here, I'm pretty sure material decreases, I could probably count on one hand, maybe I would need the start of the second hand. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it, it's averaging probably two a year across second or third reading. And there's a couple, I think it was once. And there's, there's one year, I think it was actually zero. Um, and so, you know, in terms of the comment of whether to add decrease, I mean, decreases are very rarely happening. And then we already are giving appropriations tremendous power on one end because it's, it's become pretty difficult on the floor to pass a decrease. Um, whereas increases, I mean, I, I would guess we're probably passing 15 to 20 across second and third readings every year. Um, probably I, I'd lean towards even more than that. Um, so I, I guess the concept here is to, to, that I think we need to be thinking about those trade-offs and overall in 2017, first year I was here, there were a lot of people bringing those trade, those amendments where there would be a trade-off and it would be paid for. There would be a reduction and then an increase and all those failed. That was fascinating to me. It was my first year. And then I haven't seen many of those since then. And certainly if I ever brought an increase, I don't think I ever have. I, I would hope that I would do that. And I think, I think the members could, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a power for appropriations, but there's already a, a huge power there and um, it, they would be set in the base and um, you know, representative uh, Wilson's point, chairman Wilson's point. I, if there's an amendment, I think that's a good point that maybe uh, we could talk about any net increase. I, the way it's drafted is not, but we'll just leave it the way it is and, and have a vote. But uh, I think I responded Oh, yeah. And then on uh, Representative Olson's point, Chairman Olson's point, um, I, I, I think, like he said, I mean, the amendments on the Senate side would come in on a consent on, on the mere budget. So I don't think it would violate this. I mean, it, it would create an interesting dynamic, but I think they would follow. Um, I think I think they would follow our lead um, on this. That, that's what I would think. So anyway, that's my responses. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, you know, uh, we're all duly elected, right? And I have as much right as anybody else to say that I want an increase in the budget. I just do. I, I, as an elected, as elected representative, I have the right to make that amendment. 
we think now in times of great shortfall, but we've had times of great surplus as well. And uh, whether uh, whether your budget amendment rises or fails is is entirely upon what the body believes should happen. And and certainly, I don't think you should have to pair a, a you know a, a budgets you know a budget increaser with a budget decreaser. You know, we play those games and approaches to try to maintain the budget. And 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 uh, Chairman Greer's right. You, you you pass this, and you put even more power in the hands of appropriations. On and against. Representative Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> At the beginning of this, uh, Representative, uh, the bringer of the amendment suggested that this was paired after the federal approach of pay as you go. And there's a big difference in that we have a balanced budget requirement that the federal government doesn't have. And so we already have <clears throat> at least that uh, in terms of a spending constraint. And so I think pay as you go at the federal level uh, is uh, driven by their lack of a balanced budget amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Gray. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your indulgence. I, I kind of see where it's going, but I, I do want to respond to that. I mean, I, I, pay as you go, first of all, they don't really follow it. Uh, they, they, they supersede it a lot. I, I, should, I should have said that earlier. Um, but the second point, I think, I mean, the budget balance, you know, the, at the end of the day, there's a provision in there that the rainy day fund can be used to balance it, um, especially on the school's end. So, and, and there's the BRA. So, I mean, I, I just think that the idea that it is completely balanced, I mean, I, I, I don't totally subscribe to that. So it's balanced in terms of the fact that our reserves can be used to balance it, but, but is it balanced off of revenues? Um, I, I would say no, not necessarily. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any further discussion from the members? So uh, Representative uh, Chairman Harshman, I allowed you to speak. I didn't get you into the room, but if you'd like to speak to this, uh, you should be able to unmute and speak. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Please proceed. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> really, um, and I don't want to interrupt your flow. I've been watching you. I was hoping I could do what uh, Chairman Zwanser did, move my little rule up because I was going to meet my wife. <laughs> if not, uh, on this one, public comment, you guys are doing great. I know where this is going. This, I would not, uh, I really encourage you to not vote for this. I think you know where it's going, but uh, wow. I, uh, yeah, so I, I get you represent Gray, but boy, I just wouldn't go there. I think in the end, it'll hurt all of us and it'll hurt the state. So that's my comments, but. Uh, and Chairman, could, Chairman Harshman, if you send us an amendment, we don't have it. So well, did you email us one? It's been emailed to you, Mr. Speaker. And that was, I thought it would be forwarded to you automatically. I submitted it yesterday. I didn't realize I had the email to you. So my apologies, but you have it now in your box. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, it was forwarded to us from Rihanna. Okay, I, I just found it. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman. All right, further discussion on the amendment before us, further discussion, our voting on the amendment and this is the first gray amendment. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you, all those opposed. All right, the motion has failed, the amendment has failed. Representative Gray, uh, you wanna move to the next um, rule 11 amendment? Mr. Speaker, with your indulgence, I'm I'm happy to yield to Speaker uh, Harshman. He said he wanted to do his if if he would or uh, to represent to Chairman Harshman, um, Mr. Speaker. If if you're okay with that, he, I know he said he had a, a conflict. He has a date, is what he has. He's going to meet my lovely wife. <laughs> He's put up with my crap for a long time. Well, then, um, with the indulgence of with with the uh, we thank you, Representative Gray. Uh, Thank you. Chairman Harshman, if you'd like to present yours, move your, present yours, and then we'll see what the body does. Okay, members, it's that 15-5 rule on cell phones. Of course, we don't allow folks to talk on their phone on the House floor during the session. And uh, all I wanted to do, well, first of all, there's a word that's mistyped that needs cleaned up device. But then 
here's what I guess I've seen the last couple of years, and it's a new phenomenon that never happened before. You know, first it was the computers, and I, we're probably not going to build it because we're going to be moving to a paperless system. So computers are going to be on and open. But but I'm seeing during debate, lobbyists texting members, no, I'll say this, this, and this, or this, this, and this. And I guess to me, third reading used to always be, I mean, I see members typing and all that. I, I get it. We're probably not getting away from that. But it used to be, man, everybody sat there and you sat in your chair and then you'd spin around to this mic and listen to this rep and then you'd spin over here and listen to this guy and this gal and you'd settle in your chair and then you'd make your final vote. And I'm seeing lobbyists text people debate points against us. And then I'm wondering who's actually elected then. And I guess I could send an email, but I just think these things, these are killing all our brains. And I'd like us to just have a little point with third reading, you're ready to pass a bill that might become a law for our people. It's just settle and, and really listen to the magic of the debate and let the 60 of us duly elected decide. So that's my point. I, I know I'm fighting technology on this, but thank you, Mr. Chair, Speaker. Well, would it matter if it was an Apple phone versus an Android? I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. Do, the, do the, any of the committee members have any questions for uh, Chairman Harshman? Any questions for Chairman Harshman? Uh, Rep, I see Representative Jennings and then Chairman Greer and then uh, Majority Footer Summers. Representative Jennings. Yeah, uh, Chairman Harshman, I've uh, always voted with you about not doing the uh, electronic votes and things of that nature. But if we're, if this desk is our office, how are we going to, you know, affect and tell people what they can and can't do there at their own office? And and we're doing Zoom right now. Some of us are at home, and you know, things that wouldn't have happened a year ago are commonplace today. So how would you, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how you do that. How you, how do you tell these people they can't have their phone? I, I don't know what lobbyist would, would text me, but, um, and, or that I, and I certainly wouldn't know how to text back very well, <laughs> but I, it just seems like that if this is, I mean, it seems like that might be reaching into people's own space. All right. Thank you, Chairman Greer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I do get texts all the time on third reading, but I, I, um, I don't, I put my phone away. It's the same way I don't look at my email. I, I, um, I don't know, I just have an old fashioned view of how I like it to go. And that's how I do it. And even lobbyists thinks they're going to influence my vote on third reading. They're barking up the wrong tree. I can tell you that much. Uh, I guess I, I guess my problem with it is this, you know, you, you roll this bill out and um, there might be a propensity of the 66 to go ahead and debate this for an hour and 35 minutes. Uh, and the simple fact is, is you don't solve the issue because you've got your emails on your computer that are up and being used. So I just, um, just, just food for thought there, uh, Mr. Speaker Harshman. All right. Um, I don't remember who had their hand up otherwise, and I apologize. Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I would have agreed with this uh, motion before kind of this whole pandemic and virtual um, committee meetings and virtual sessions. But, but now, um, to be honest, texting is the only way we can really communicate and organize. And in fact, uh, one member of the rules committee here has been trying to get me to get everybody's cell number. And I, I agree with him. I think we need to be able to have more um, conversation among us, particularly now where it's tough to do that. And, uh, and so it would be hard to regulate. Is that a text from your, from a cohort in the body, or is that a text from a lobbyist? And, and I'm a, uh, 
and I know exactly what the what the good former speaker is talking about. But I've seen it with email just as much as text. I've seen email come out on our computer. I've seen members go to the mic and repeat exactly what was on the what was on the email right out of a lobby group. And you're going really, um, but it happens anyway. And I don't think uh, we can curb that. In fact, now I think. Uh, the ability to text our colleagues in the body is become kind of essential. Further further questions or comments for the bringer of the amendment? I've got Chairman Wilson and then Chairman Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, uh, it's not so much a comment on the on the amendment, but I have to insert here if Representative Summers thinks getting my cell phone number is going to help him any because generally my phone is in my purse turned off. And so I regret to say I'm and former speaker knows perfectly well. He used to send out little texts saying, let's have a chairman meeting at 930. And I wouldn't get it until 1010 because I wasn't looking at my phone. So that's not really pertinent. And I apologize for that. But I wanted to warn Representative Summers while he was there that you might have to try something else. Smoke signals, smoke signals. Uh, Chairman Olson. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, we can vote on this. I was just going to lighten the mood a little by saying I would support it only if it banned flip phones on the floor oh, as well. Oh. oh, well, you'll be you'll be glad to know. I thought it was a requirement that you could use a flip phone because that would cut down on the number amount of texting that could get done. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions for the chairman? Chairman Harshman, you want to wrap anything up for us? Yeah, I, I appreciate your indulgence. I uh, I know, I just, I'm just thinking third reading and I just think we're gonna, we keep losing little bits and, and to my good friend, the majority floor leader, I'm not talking about pandemic. I'm talking about when we come back in and maybe that can be wordsmiths a little bit, but when the 60 of us are there inside the bar, and you're ready to, ready to do the I or nay when your name's called for when it really matters, right? And I just think we're losing it. We're losing some of that. And I get it, the computer thing too is out there, but uh, this thing is even more, you know, uh, human attention span used to be around 20 seconds and, and it's dropped now to about 10 seconds. And a goldfish is 13. And I just think uh, we're going to lose that. And I, so I've, <clears throat> I don't know why. And I, I don't know. but anyway, thank you for your consideration. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Um, further questions for the chairman? All right. Committee, what's your pleasure? Committee, what's your pleasure? Chairman Greer. Mr. Speaker, um, I'm going to move the amendment to the um, and uh, I'm going to ask second. for the end. There's a second by Summers. Go ahead, please. Okay. So then um, what I would like to do then is, is entertain an amendment uh, in, in, in such a way uh, to clean up the, the, the typo. So you want to divide the amendment with device being one and striking the second sentence and the second sentence being the other? That's how you want to do it. <laughs> so uh, I'll move to divide that uh, just as you said. So, and then uh, speak to and uh, that we correct the typo and we call for the question on division one. Mr. Chairman, didn't we already correct this typo or in our earlier amendment? Oh, we did. I think it was one of the three that we got from uh, Pam. All right, hold on. You may Sorry, I didn't pick that up, Mr. Speaker. Sorry. Yes, we did. Oh, okay. 15 5. 15 5. So you're withdrawing your amendment to, to uh, thank you, Chairman Wilson, for keeping track of what we did. Yep, well, Mr. 15 Speaker. 5. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, so uh, just out of, uh, you know, a lingering loyalty for uh, Speaker Harshman, I uh, 
we'll go ahead and uh, take this to a vote for discussion, I guess. All right, further discussion, further discussion, further discussion on the amendment. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. All those opposed? We didn't have somebody vote, so. Uh, no. All those, you didn't uh, let's vote. re-vote. Well, I didn't, I didn't have enough people here though. Oh, I've got, I'm looking at too many people. So all, I, those, Mr. all Mr. those in favor, Wanser, please. I raise think it hand. was Representative Chairman Zwanser just went on and off. So I think that's what maybe threw you off. He just barely left. Okay, so all those in favor, please raise your hand. I apologize. I had a different screen and it changed. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. All those opposed? One, two, three, four, five. Chairman makes six. The uh, motions failed. Amendments failed. Was thank that you. five to five? That was five to six. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was five to five before I voted, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Keep counting. The number doesn't change. <laughs> You've been on appropriations way too long. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you go enjoy go enjoy dinner with your wife. I'm gonna bring this bad boy on the floor. <laughs> and you can tell him it was a tie vote. All right. All right. Uh, Representative Gray. Actually, we've got Representative Larson in the waiting room as well. He's not a member of this committee. So Representative Gray, would you would you be willing to let him complete, do his motion um, before we take up the rest of yours. Representative Summers is gonna be last. We're gonna make him wait no matter what, so. Ha happy to, Mr. Speaker. All right, uh, Representative Mr. Larson. Yeah, Mr. Rep Speaker, real yes. quick. Would yes. my, my computer went out, would my vote have made a difference on that last one? Um, it, I, I don't know how you were gonna vote, but I'm told that it'll be presented to the body later. Okay, thank you. Uh, point of order, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Gray. Just so, just so we do have clarity, I mean, if you did vote aye, I think it would have been tied. So I, I think it would have failed either way. Um, yeah, but I, I believe he's going to bring it. But just to answer your question, thanks. Yep. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Representative Gray. Um, Representative Larson, do you have an amendment before us? This is for a new rule, 11, a 1211H and yeah, 1211H and 12 13. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay, I bring this amendment again like I did last year due to actions taken in the 2019 session where a procedural motion was made and acted upon that was not specifically referenced in the House rules and should have been ruled out of order. This issue concerns the use of rescind motion in the House. The question is whether the House may utilize a rescind motion when it is absent in reference in the House rules. Only reconsider reconsideration is referenced in the House rules. Rescind is indeed in the Senate rules and re reconsideration, sorry about that, is also in the Senate rules. Mason's manual section 480-4 states that the motion to rescind is principally used to reverse a previous action after time for reconsideration has passed. The motion to rescind is not in order when the question can be reached by a motion to reconsider. Accordingly, the available, available motion would be notice, uh, would have been notice to reconsider. That did not happen. When considering the tobacco products bill in 2019, a rescind motion was made. It is my understanding of the Masons that if one motion is referenced in the House rules, which is reconsideration, and the other is not, which is rescind, the referenced reconsideration motion should have been the only available motion. Accordingly, on the tobacco products, the deadline for the notice of reconsideration had passed, thus requiring, at the very least, a suspension of the rules vote, since no reconsideration notice was given before the deadline. The 
because the House rules are absent any reference to rescind motion. I rec recognize the Mason says when a rescind motion is referenced and available, it is debatable and it takes the bill back to a considered to back to as considered when last acted upon on third reading. So it would also be open for amendments, but absent any reference of the rescind motion in the house rules and with the reconsideration motion that was available not being exercised, the rescind motion should only have been applicable after a suspension of the rules vote, which did not happen. One has to question if the rescind motion was out of order and not available with or without a vote to suspend the rules Mason seems very clear on this. Given the above Mason's manual guidance, perhaps the rules committee would again consider taking this issue up. I think we should consider amending the rules to include a rescind motion as is available in the Senate rules. And with that, I uh, conclude uh, for uh, questions. Thank you very much. Um, members, any, any questions for uh, Representative Larson? Questions, uh, Representative Greer, and then Representative Washington. Chairman Greer. So, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Larson, probably can you hear me better. <laughs> <laughs> I can. Uh, okay, so my question is then, if we're if we're coming down to the end of the session, um, and uh, and uh, you do a motion to rescind. How, how, so you could do a motion to rescind a vote um, on, on committee of the whole that, that killed a bill. Um, how does that, uh, I, I guess maybe you wouldn't use it at that point in time. Um, I, I'm just trying to play how that works on those last couple of days before crossover in the end of session. Uh, Representative, let's take a couple more questions and then we'll come back to you. Think on it, Representative Larson. Uh, Representative Yin. Oh, I'm sorry. I had Representative Washit first. My apologies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is simply, uh, I'd like to see an example of when uh, clearly we had a vote in the past where it shouldn't have been allowed, but I guess I'm still not following what's the value of having this resend option available. When would we really use it and, and how would it be beneficial? Okay, thank you. Representative Yen, you had a, something and then we'll, we'll let Representative Larson um, respond to some of these. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So our house rule 1-2 parliamentary practice says that the rules of parliamentary practice comprise of Mason's manual shall govern the house in all cases which they can apply and which are not inconsistent with the rules and orders of the house and joint rules. So I, I'm not sure, maybe you can explain to me, um, Representative Larson, um, what, what the situation is where we cannot use the rescission of the vote because it, it's already defined in Masons and we have a rule that's saying that Masons applies anywhere it's not inconsistent with our rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, so we've kind of um, given you several things, Representative Larson, so um, take what you think, take what you want to, and if you're not comfortable taking something, that's fine. Mr. Chairman, I don't know how comfortable I am with all of that. Um, you know, I've been reading Masons here, and I don't, uh, I, I would ask, can I bring in someone else that uh, kind of was helping me with this? Would that be okay with you? I think he's in so the we'll do room. public. We'll do some public oh. testimony. Okay. Okay. You have somebody that wants to provide public testimony. I think on this. would maybe help clarify this. That's been in the uh, watching our uh, business for many years. Okay. Um, Representative McGuire and then Chairman Greer. Vice Chairman McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to offer, I've got Mason's open uh, section 483, the vote to rescind. If anybody would appreciate it, I would be happy to read that. If not, I will. Uh, go ahead and just, just uh, 480 is the decision is what's referenced in this rule. So whatever, whatever is appropriate, if you want to give us some background. Okay, it is uh, section 483, vote required to rescind. The motion to rescind requires the same vote as would be required to repeal the act, which is sought to 
we sin. And then there's a period. In the absence of any special rule, this is a majority vote. Neither a notice nor a two-thirds vote is necessary unless exp expressly required in the rules. And that's the sum total of vote to rescind. Thank you. Um, so I guess, uh, Chairman Greer. Yeah, so Mr. Speaker, I, so I have a question on this because I'm trying to I'm trying to box in the end game here. And so when you look at 481, two, okay, it says the motion to rescind may be made at any subsequent meeting, as long as no rights have intervened, and is not limited to any specific or particular time during which the motion can be made. My question is: is when we send a report to the Senate? or a message to the Senate, is that an intervening right? Where, where does that cut off? And if, and if that is an intervening right, when we send the message to the Senate, um, I think there's enough of a, a sideboard on this uh, that I, I kind of like it as another tool. So I, if somebody can answer that question for me, it might change how I vote on this. Um, Representative Larson, you wanted to interject? Yeah, I can read these too, and I I would agree with uh, Chairman Greer. I, I think that would be an intervening moment. Moment uh, above that, it also says a legislative body can rescind an action previously taken, as long as no vested rights have arisen from the original action. In this respect, the motion to rescind is in effect the same as a motion to reconsider, but you do need to realize uh, also one benefit maybe might be that uh, the motion to rescind may be made by any member, whether that person voted for the prevailing side, which during uh, a reconsideration, you need to use that type. Uh, so maybe that helps. Thank you. Further questions, further questions from the committee? I, can I oh, add sorry. one more? Yes, Mr. Go ahead, Representative Larson. Mr. My Chairman, question. I should have added another part of that. Uh, also, the motion is debatable, and it is open, uh, and it opens the entire question to debate. And I'm not sure if reconsideration would allow that. I'd have to look. All right. Further questions for discussion? Further questions for Representative Larson? Further questions? Um, Representative Larson, did you have somebody that you wanted to invite to the meeting that would want to give some thoughts. So I, I see a Mark Larson. Is that who you were? Any? So any, yes. any questions? So we're taking some public uh, testimony now. Uh, Mr. Larson with a, without the U, Mark Larson. Uh, please open up your camera. Hello, Mr. Larson. Great to see you. Uh, if you'd like to provide some comment to this. Well, Mr. Speaker. Yes, sir, I do, Mr. Speaker. And thank you so much for letting me participate in your process. I am Mark Larson with the Wyoming Petroleum Marketers Association, but uh, for the record, I'm not here uh, as a representative of marketers. I'm here representing myself as a 14-year participant in your process. Uh, let me please state that uh, I also was a, a four-term legislator in another state. I, I truly do love the process and, and the parliamentary procedure. Uh, but I will say that, too, that, that there's a lot of surety that uh, goes into having the rules and be able to play them. Uh, indeed, the rules are the, the art of statesmen. Um, I love the process. Uh, in regard to the questions that came up, um, let me set the stage a little bit and what prompted me to reach out to Rep Larson when he was on the uh, rules committee. Uh, in the, the tobacco products bill uh, was... Uh, uh, killed um, and it was um, the motion to reconsider operation and the sponsor could not find somebody to, who voted on the prevailing side to do the reconsideration. Um, as Speaker Harshman at that time decided that it was uh, okay to invoke the uh, rescind motion and they referenced that in, in the digest. Uh, unfortunately, since, uh, and Mason's is pretty clear on it, that they did not uh, do a suspend the rules in order to get to the rescind motion. They just went straight to the rescind motion. Um, 
later on um, in the Wyoming Works uh, bill, um, the rescind motion was used in the cow, uh, in the committee of the whole. And, and, and clearly Mason's uh, says that uh, the, the notice of reconsideration, which Mason's also says is very similar to the rescind motion, uh, says that that doesn't happen in the cow. The reconsideration doesn't. And so, uh, and there was no suspension of the rules in that, in that regard either. So my, my point, Mr. Speaker and, and committee members is that if the tool is gonna be utilized by the body, then we ought to probably put it into the rules so that they know what's available to them. And so does the lobbying corps and citizens and for what Representative Gray was talking about earlier in transparency. And with respect to uh, Representative Greer's, uh, or Chairman Greer's comments about um, when it would be used, the uh, Masons on 484 uh, says that the motion to rescind is not in order when the question can be reached by a motion to reconsider. And that's why you see the language in the amendment that addresses an H uh, that it is not available unless the motion to reconsider has been exhausted or if the motion to re reconsider time has passed. Um, when you talk about intervening rights, I think uh, Representative Larson addressed that well. Uh, when the legislative body ratifies a, con a contract or when they pass the, the uh, measure out of the House and in, 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 the, in the case of the tobacco bill, the speaker had not signed a bill. So therefore it had not been, or, or signed the, the letter. So therefore it had not transferred over to the Senate. So uh, if there was a, a suspension of the rules, uh, uh, vote at that time, and then they went to reconsideration. I imagine it probably could have been utilized. But um, on, on, the, on the motion to reconsider on a cow, uh, I, I, that kind of boggled my procedural mind. Um, when we look at the uh, Masons, and, and I think that uh, I don't know that it has been abused in the Senate. You know, having watched for 14 years, I don't know that I remember rescind being used in the Senate. Uh, but what prompted me in 2019 was that we had it used twice uh, in in the in the body, and so therefore my my goal was simply to reach out. Uh, I really appreciate Rep. Larson continuing the charge and bringing it forward again. I have seen the rescind motion be utilized very effectively. Um, and, but, and I don't believe that it abrogates the responsibility of the member to utilize the reconsideration because that's also a tool and um, should be used when it's on the, uh, and it's only a majority vote. If you do pass the rescind motion as it's written in the amendment, uh, I would recommend that you keep the two thirds vote, put a little bit higher level for that tool to be used in the toolbox and it doesn't become procedurally abusive. Mr. Speaker, I'll answer any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Larson. Um, and we have questions, Representative Yim. Mr. Speaker, thank you, Mr. Larson. Um, so it, it seems to be predicated on the idea that we had to suspend the rules to do a motion or decision. And I, I'm, I'm still unsure on why that's the case because again, According to Rule 1-2, Mason's governs any time uh, it's not inconsistent with the rules. Because the motion to rescind is in Mason's, um, I'm not sure why we have to explicitly add it into the rules to use it. And in fact, we haven't had to explicitly have in the rules to use it because we have used it a couple of times, as you've noted. Um, and, and I don't think that's improper. Um, so, so I guess my question to you is where in Mason's that you have mentioned is says says that we would need to suspend the rules to do a motion to re rescind. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Rep um, any other questions? Get a couple questions here. Uh, Representative Gray, and then we'll go to Mr. Larson. Okay, I, I've always, thank you, Mr. Speaker, I've always struggled with the wording of this. And, and I think with that testimony, I'm finally starting to really see the thrust of this. Um, couldn't the Rules Committee, Mr. Larson, also take the position that it would take a motion to suspend the rules to use a rescission in the way that it was used in the past. I mean, I, I, uh, rather than put it in the rules, I would just say that I think in the future it should be, it should require a motion to suspend rather than us put, put that in there. And that 
that I think would be my position. And I think I'm understanding the thrust of this now. Um, am I making sense? That's my question. Okay, Is that well, another way for us to handle this issue? We won't ask him about the second part of your question. We'll let him only re respond to the first part. So I think you have two questions, Mr. Larson. The first one is the rule 1-2, uh, and the second is the suspension as a vehicle to uh, do the rescission. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative Vienne, Representative Gray. My goal was to, to have transparency. Um, and if you have it caught up or put in into the rules, then you know that tool is available. And there's a myriad of other options when you go through Masons and you learn Masons that you could possibly use that same provision that you're talking about, Representative Yen. Um, I agree, Representative Gray, if you put the suspend the rules requirement in there, then that probably satisfies a lot of our issue. But for transparency and for process, it just seems to me that if you're going to utilize that tool, then go ahead and put it in your rules so that you know that it's, it's there. And, and uh, I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Any further questions from Mr. Larson or uh, Representative Larson? Thank you, committee. Thank you. Further, further questions? All right, committee, what's your pleasure? Or discussion, and then what's your pleasure? Any discussion? Committee, what's your pleasure? Uh, Representative Yen, my apologies, I looked down. Mr. Speaker, I, I think I'll just reiterate, um, un unless we wanna do something different than Masons, for example, if the idea is that you wanna make it a two thirds threshold to to do a motion of rescission, which is different than what is in Masons, I, I don't see that this rule is necessary. So um, if we started putting everything in Masons in our house rules verbatim, then I, I, I think we will have a very large book of house rules and, and I don't think that's what we want. So um, someone else is happy to make a motion to, to raise that threshold, but I'm not super interested in uh, doing that at this time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, further discussion, Representative Greer, Chairman Greer. Mr. Speaker, I'm inclined to move uh, the amendment forward, but I would like that threshold to be two thirds. Um, and, and I'll just be honest with you, one uh, well, of the only times I ever stormed off the House floor uh, dealt with that Wyoming Works vote, so. I remember I was almost in your way as you stormed. All right, uh, further discussion. So there's a motion to- I'll, I'll, I'll move the amendment, yes. Moving the amendment, but you're amending it to two thirds, correct? Correct. Okay, so now instead of uh, a firm vote of two thirds of the elected members. Is that accurate? And is there a second to that? Representative Gray, did you second that? And second. Representative Wilson. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Discussion on the motion. Majority Floor Leader Summers. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you. And being the one of the offenders the, to use this rescinds order, or motion, um, I, I speak against it. I think we need tools and I don't believe in two thirds. I think the body rules by majority vote. And uh, so on and against uh, this motion. Further discussion on the motion? Further discussion? So the motion is uh, to adopt and with the two thirds um, instead of majority. Any further discussion? Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. All right, those opposed? So the chairman votes no, the, the um, motion has failed. Further discussion or further motions on this? Further discussion on this. Thank you, Representative Larson. We expect it to be on the floor as well. <laughs> you and Harshman get together and make it one big amendment, would you please? <laughs> Two thirds and nobody can talk on their cell phone. I think we can get it through. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Larson. <coughs> 
I see Representative Harshman is back in the waiting room. Apparently that was a pretty short date. He must've showed up late. All right, um, next we'll go to Representative Gray. You have another motion on 11-3. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I will move uh, the second amendment on 11-3. Thank you, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So what this does, it's a little oh, bit more- Actually, just doing a quick ex explanation and then yeah. we'll do a motion. This one's a little more lenient than the original one. It, it requires a statement that on an amendment that uh, that there is a court that that basically this is increasing net appropriations in a budget. It would say this amendment contains an increase in appropriations without an offsetting decrease. We've always debated what it should say, but I think it, uh, for transparency's sake, it 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 should be clear because sometimes it's not really clear that this is net increasing the budget when there is an amendment to the budget and it is a net increase, which I think is a big deal. And um, I think that statement should be somewhere in the amendment for transparency's sake. So that's that's what this does. This has been brought in the past by myself and actually current speaker brought it once after changing the wording a little bit. And uh, it's gotten close a couple times and I'd like to try it again. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Representative Gray? Representative Conley. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Representative Gray, are you honestly kind of just conceiving or perceiving of a form that the that you know LSO is going to have two different forms and one form would have on it this statement and the uh, another form would not have this statement on it? Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's pretty you know, I, I think happy to have language to clear it up, but I think it's pretty clear. It says in the amendment. So I think it would be on the bottom. Uh, the following statement, maybe I'd put at the bottom of the amendment. I'll make that amendment at the end of our discussion. Um, at the bottom of the page, it, it would just say that kind of maybe centered. I don't think we need to put that in the, in the uh, but I think they'd make it look nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any other questions for representing Gray? I don't know. Is that like a different font? You get a different font or what? I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Not in it's, color it's getting, Representative Gray was worried we weren't going to work late enough tonight. So I want to thank him for making us do our jobs. <laughs> All right. Any other any other questions for Representative Gray? Representative, any questions for Representative Gray? All right. Committee, what's your pleasure? Representative Gray, I think you've already moved the, moved it previously. So there is a second. There's a second. Uh, we'll go with Representative Olson. All right. Discussion on the amendment and any amendments to the amendment. Yep. Mr. Speaker, Gray. thank you. Um, I would like to amend the amendment to say uh, on line five of the amendment, it would read uh, the following statement at the bottom of the amendment. The following statement at the bottom of the amendment. So you'd strike in and add the words at the bottom of. So the, it will read now, the same amendment shall include the following statement at the bottom of the amendment. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. So we're striking, we're striking in and inserting at. Is that accurate? It, at the bottom of. At the bottom, excuse me. We're, we're striking in, adding at, and inserting bottom. We're inserting at the bottom of. The following statement at the bottom of the amendment. So we're inserting at the bottom of. All right, the secretary has it. So I'm not going to try to second guess the secretary. All right, discussion on the amendment to the amendment. Discussion on the amendment to the amendment. Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can uh, just see that this would be setting a precedent that could take us down a slippery slope. Uh, if we're going to eliminate full-time positions, are we going to need to put notations in there? Uh, there are just a lot of things that the budget does. And uh, if we're going to have a warning on every or on certain ones, um, that could be it could get broad very quickly. That would be my only comment. Thank you. 
Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further uh, discussions on the amendment of the amendment, which adds the words at the bottom of the, of, yeah. Uh, Representative Yin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so this, this amendment feels like the warning labels that California puts on everything where they say <laughs> this, uh, this product has been known to cause cancer. Like I didn't already know that was true. Um, and so I, I feel the same way about budget amendments. I think I know that a budget amendment would increase the appropriation and I don't need to be told at the bottom of the amendment. So it, it feels kind of weird and I don't know why every re a representative needs to be told that. So I'll probably be voting no on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> All right, we were good until the California thing. All right, Representative Olson. Yeah, just on the amendment, this is just placing it at the bottom of the, this is just for where the, amend, where the amendment would take place. So just for clarification, if you vote against, if you vote against this motion, um, then you're saying that the language must be contained within the amendment. I think that's a little confusing. I think you want to pass this amendment so this language doesn't appear randomly in the middle of an amendment, um, just the way it's worded. And then, I, I, and then I guess we could speak more specifically to the, the, the substance of the amendment itself, but it's a good uh, amendment to the amendment. All right, further discussion on the amendments the amendment, further discussion, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All right, motion is, all those opposed? All right, no bottom feeders on that vote. All right, the amendment, the amendment has been amended. We're back on the amendment. Discussion on the amendment as amended. Discussion on, uh, yes, Madam Minority Floor Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yep, on and against the amendment. Honestly, we have, we have an amendment in front of us. We have numbers that are in the amendment. It, there, are, there are numbers that are crossed out in terms of the budget, and it either is increased or decreased. And so I don't see any reason for us to go down this road. I'll also go back to a former statement. It doesn't do anything about decreases as well, which could be as relevant. And so on and against, we don't need it. Okay, further discussion on the amended amendment? Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Wait, wait, hold on, I would like to say something, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I, sorry, I, I didn't see it. Representative Gray. Jeez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, um, you know, I, I think FTEs, you talked about FTEs earlier. It's pretty clear when you're crossing out an FTA, but it, this is really not as much about the members, about transparency for the public, because it's actually kind of cryptic, some of them. Some of them are clear because it says line X, uh, change 100,000, 150,000, but some are not structured that way. And it's actually not clear what is going on. And it's about, it's about uh, transparency. And as far as, you know, decreases, I mean, I'm happy to consider an, um, another rule change for that. I mean, like I said, I, I think materially during my time here, I've probably only seen four or five decreases ever pass on the budget. But usually there are 20 to 25 increases. And I think uh, they are monumental moments, at least for me in terms of trying to get a control on our budget. And I think it should be clear. That's my opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, Majority Floor Leader Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, you know, it seems like when we take a vote, we just kind of not too long ago talked about taking a vote. Anytime we change, you know, whether we add or decrease from the budget. So it's made really clear in our vote at the time we vote whether that amendment adds to or decreases from the budget. And, uh, and so I, I really don't see the, the need for this as far as transparency. I mean, it's, it's clear in our vote. It's, it's talked about, it's, anyway, I'm not sure why we would do this. Okay, further discussion on the amended amendment. Further discussion, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? The motion has failed. The amendment has, has failed. Representative Gray, next amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to move uh, the third amendment I brought in that email, which is the Audit Standing Committee Amendment. 
Okay. Uh, I, yeah, just do some explanation first and then we'll okay. do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This was off of uh, discussions in the Management Audit Committee, and um, the Management Audit Committee is created in statute, and it is a standing committee. The Management Audit Committee is able to bring legislation, but it is not able to hear legislation during a session, and I think that they should be able to have bills referred to them. Uh, there was a bill that we had worked a lot on, and uh, it was referred to another committee and really there wasn't the background there on that. That was over in the Senate, uh, but the way the rules are structured, we'd have to amend it in each uh, house. And I've asked someone over in the Senate, I, I believe they're hearing, I'm not hundred percent sure, but we can only control our own rules because it's set out in each, each house's rules, the, the standing committees that can hear bills during session. So this would allow the speaker at, at their discretion to send bills to the management audit committee while we're meeting. And I think the fact that in statute, the management audit committee is able to write bills. I think they should be able to hear bills at, at the speaker's uh, discretion during session. We've talked a little about this in the committee and um, I'm really excited about the direction of the management audit committee. I think it's kind of been retooled a little bit. We've got a direction. We're still working out some kinks, but I think we are, we are um, bringing more bills uh, that's one direction we're going. Rather than focusing so much on performance audits, we're looking at, at um, we're, we're also having oversight over three or four agencies, and we've thought about bills for those agencies, and, and I think we should be able to hear bills during session. Um, so that's what the amendment does. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Does anybody have any just general questions for Representative Gray? Uh, Representative Summers, and then Representative Yeah. Um Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman and Representative Gray. The question I would have for you is, is why a house rule and not uh, coming before as a joint rule? Um, obviously, I think if you had a joint committee and management on it, then both bodies would want to have standing committees. And and I don't know that I'm interested in the audit committee, but I have an interested interest in us adding a technology committee at some point as a standing committee. Um, but um, I guess the question is, why a House amendment and not a joint rule amendment? Thank you. Um, any other questions? I think Representative Connolly had some thoughts, and then we'll, we'll circle back to Representative Gray. We won't go one at a time. Go ahead, Representative Connolly. And then yeah, thanks, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, Representative Gray, this is, this is intriguing. I've served on management audit, and to be honest with you, I can't imagine it as a standing committee that would get bills during session with the management audit committee I was on, right? I mean, that was a committee that had scoping papers and then over the course of a year and a half produced um, or had staff produce, you know, a hundred page reports. That's what the audit committee that I was on. So I would like and would need a whole lot more information, I think from the, the members of the committee like yourself, as well as the joint chairs, things like that, before going forward with wanting a new committee at this point. So I'm just, just kind of letting you know that I think it's an intriguing idea, but it's very different than the audit committee that I served on, which was not that long ago. Um, so thank you, M Madam and Lord Floyd. So I'll, I'll mention two things that have happened in the last two years that have changed, I think, from your tenure there is one uh, management council has made the audit management audit committee, the home committee for ETS and for A&I and for the public funds division of department of revenue. So, um, so we do get substantive, um, we do receive agency reports and agency um, type of um, interaction the same way that other committees do. And in fact, this year we have, we sponsored a bill to change, um, we, we did sponsor a bill and it's gonna to go to some other committee, probably corporation. Um, so only one bill, but, but so I, just to be clear, there has been some change in responsibility in the last couple of years. Um, Chairman Wilson and then again, uh, Chairman uh, Representative McGuire, Chairman Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it was interesting to hear about um, ETS and ANI because I have certainly thought for some long while that they needed some standing committee oversight. But I almost wonder, you know, when, when I first saw this, 
I'm thinking, well, I'm not sure they really have enough, would have enough to do compared to how many bills go through the other committees. I, I would almost see this as being um, an interim topic, bringing in the Senate with the idea, bringing in Representative Summers thought. I mean, if we were to actually re redo some of this so that you had one committee say that was elections, political subdivisions and audit and another committee that was corporations and technology, let's just say. I mean, that could bring in something. And, and I'm just wondering whether rather than just putting audit in here as a rule, it seems to me that this the discussion of how over time the workload and just changes in society would better, we could better address them more broadly. I, I think that that would be a really great approach better than just changing the rule. All right, thank you. Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and this would include our bureaucracy building uh, good majority four leader. Uh, the question would be with regard to staffing during the session, would we have to increase staff or would we, would uh, they be able to make adjustments in order to adequately staff um, with what we currently have? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Gray, we'll let you follow, finish up some or answer anything, then we'll go to Olson and Wash it. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just writing down this stuff and thanks for letting me answer a couple because it starts to add up and then you lose yep, track. Sorry. <laughs> um, so a, a couple things here. Um, I, I only envision this for a few bills every session on the last comment. I mean, I think it's almost like rules and procedure, our committee. I've only seen bills referred to our committee to rules and procedure uh, probably two or three times during my time during my time in the legislature's been four years. I think it's similar to that. It would be uh, a bill having to do with those agencies that we have oversight for or a bill that the committee had written and has the expertise on. And so I don't think it would require any extra staffing. I think we would meet outside of the typical meeting periods, probably in an evening or a lunch period, if it worked in our schedules, or it would be a very narrow thing, almost like the rules and procedure committee that we're in now. Um, but I, I, on the joint rule issue, I, I would like to answer that. I mean, if, if possible, we could bring in Mr. Obrecht or, or Ms. Mumford. Um, the way the rules are structured, are the, the committees where you can send bills to are in each of our individual rules. So to write a joint rule would require us putting all those committees in the joint rule. And so they asked and encouraged me to, to bring it as an individual rule. And I think it's okay that way because if the Senate chooses not to do that, it's then we would hear the bill as referred to by, by the speaker. I mean, I would invite them to do that, but I don't think they have to do that. If it's a management audit bill or a bill that's in the management audit jurisdiction in, in our uh, committee jurisdiction, it would be referred over there. It, it doesn't have to be over in the Senate, but I think I think they would follow our lead. And I, and I, I, I asked a number to uh, hear that over there, uh, and I, I hope they are. Um, I know Senator Beitman is, was not able to respond, but um, I hope they are. Um, but I don't think we need a joint rule. I think we lead on this and, and just allow uh, bills to be referred over there. And even if there's a discretion, even if it's not over in the Senate, I don't think it matters, but I think, I think they'll add it even if it doesn't happen initially, but that's why it's not a, a joint rule is because the way it's structured is actually each house has the, the committees that they can refer bills to in their individual rules. And, and so to make it a joint rule, I'd have to move that all into the joint rule, which probably isn't a good thing to do. Um, and if the speaker, if it is possible, ring in Mr. Obrecht on the on the back end here, I'd I'd appreciate that. Talk about that. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, is there any LSO uh, attorney staff on this? I'm going to pull up participants. I don't see anybody available. Um, sorry, Mr. Speaker. I thought Anna was going to jump in on this, but she did. Sure. Um, so, so there, there was a question about, um, I guess, the context of joint rules, committees being identified in joint rules versus the individual house rules. Representative Gray, is that what, what you're wanting to have the director speak to? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Go ahead, Representative Director. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, Representative Graves correct about that. The committees are laid out in House Rule, um, I believe it's 2 2 2 2 in the Senate, it's 2 6. Okay. Um, so the appropriate place to add different uh, com standing committees would be in those two uh, places. It's not handled through joint rule because I think each house can decide what committees it wants to refer bills to. And joint committees are actually done through statute. So if they're, and, and the audit committee really is already taken care of through statute um, with the management audit committee statutes in Title 28. So uh, one house is really free to act without the um, consent of the other house in creating a new standing committee in this instance. Okay, thank you, Director. Does anybody have any other questions for Director since he was <coughs> came on? Uh, Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, interestingly, and in going back to the good majority floor leader's comment about uh, adding or creating a different committee, reading 2-2, two -two, does, does it even have to be proposed or voted on by the the rules committee, it looks like the Speaker of the House, after conferring with the majority and the minority leaders, um, I'm not sure what the word appointed means, but it looks like it's kind of at the discretion of the Speaker. And I'm just curious what what uh, Director Obrecht would, how you would read that. Thank you. All right, Director Obrecht, I think I'm probably talking about the appointment of the member of those committees. And Probably not clear enough, but Director Obrick, do you want to comment on 2 2? Well, Mr. Chairman, Representative McGuire, I, that has been the historic interpretation of, of what it means, but I can certainly see where uh, uh, Representative McGuire's point that um, you know you, you could conceivably read it to mean that, um, that the uh, presiding officer, after a consultation with min minority and majority floor leaders, could add a new committee to this list, but um, probably the list is would be read as exhaustive um, and not able to add to without an amendment to the rule. All right, any other further questions for the director? Further questions, <coughs> Representative Gray. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So my, I did have a question on the number of members. Um, right now we have six house members and that's because the statute allows the appointment of this extra member and I think it has to be opposite the chairman. So the House got the extra member because the Senate has the chairmanship. And so now we have six House members. I think next year it'll be the, this year it'll be the opposite way. We'll have five members. So should we maybe put five or six members there or should the additional member drop off when we're in session? Why do we put five members there? Uh, Director Obrecht. Mr. Chairman, it's really up to the committee or up to the uh, body on how many members they want to put on it. it. I just thought it was easier to have five so one didn't have to be appointed on the off sessions when the House didn't get the extra member, um, but can certainly be six and then add another member um, in those sessions or in those legislatures where you only have five members on, on the committee. Um, so, Director, I, I guess I'll have a, ask a quick question. If this were added, this would be the only um, statutory committee that's in this list. All the other committees are created by rule, not by statute. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, that is correct. But you, to a certain extent, you know, your appropriations committee, when it meets jointly, has statutory duties that are above and beyond what a normal interim committee's duties would be. Um, other, but other interim committee duties, ex except as those provided by management council and within Title 28, the only ones I can think of are really limited to receiving reports. Thank you. All right, any other questions for the director? Questions to the director. Any other questions for Representative Gray? Uh, Rep. Chairman Olson. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Not so much a question, just wanted to provide a little bit of edification for the members on, because I think this is, I, generally, I, I'm not opposed to the idea. And as, I want to go back to majority, um, the good majority of floor leaders comment about the technology committee, because I think if you back this up to what's currently under the jurisdiction of the budget and audit, or the audit committee, I think it makes sense to figure out if some of those items have such a big workload um, and, and we need more oversight, then yeah, that makes sense. But I think that's the first step you have to take and a little bit of edification for the members is that's, that is in, to some degree, that's actually in your hopper right now. So with respect to the technology committee, I spent the interim working on a, um, from the ETS study that we had commissioned, um, I spent the, the interim working on that and the end product result was a recommendation that we have a, a select or standing committee and there is legislation that is drafted in the, it's being drafted right now in the JAC. So there, the, those bills will come forward. So I just think that it's a good idea um, if the workload is big enough because we folded these agencies into audit where they didn't have a home and didn't fit. And I think Representative Gray is right on that, absolutely. And now it's becoming bigger and it's just getting these agencies that don't have a place. And so, yeah, they need to be, they need to have referrals to them. But I think that problem by and large exists in the ETS realm, at least from my outside looking into that committee. I don't serve on the audit committee. And I think a lot of that will be answered um, by the legislation that will allow for that committee from JAC. I think that if, if other agencies have, if we have a similar problem from other agencies on audit, that's probably the best way to address it too is, and I like what Chairman Wilson said, you know, maybe you can carve some of those off onto existing standing committees too. So I think that'd be more of a holistic way to look at it is how can we carve those out when they're big enough? Um, and so I would, I just throw that out there so the members know that there are some things out there moving around that may, would affect this. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further discussion, further discussion. Representative Gregg. Yeah, I was hoping, Mr. Speaker, thank you. I would like to ask one more question to Mr. Obrick. Why in the drafting of this did, did, did was it drafted as the audit committee, not the management audit committee? Uh, Director Obrick, are you available? Go ahead. Great question, uh, Representative Gregg. Here's why we drafted it as audit rather than management audit. Um, the, the term management as used in statute is, is a term of art. It means um, an oversight of a function or of different functions within the legislative process. So when the management audit committee acts, it's actually as oversight of the program evaluation division within the legislature and it's, it's conducting a specific task and that is overseeing those program evaluation audits or sunset audits or whatever type of audit it may be. When you meet as a standing committee, you would not have any management authority. You would only be able to receive the bills that are assigned to you by the presiding officer and then report those out with whatever recommendation the committee might find. So you wouldn't be acting within any sort of management function. So that's why we just use the term audit. Thank you, Director. All right, further discussion, further discussion. Committee, what's your pleasure? Move move the uh, rule change. Move by, move by Gray, move by Gray. Second by Jennings. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any amendments to the amendment? Yep, Mr. Speaker. Yes, please go ahead, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to amend uh, on 2-3, five and add in after five or six on uh, Romanet four, five and add in or six. So it would be five or six members. Okay, so there's an amendment to um, add or six. Is there a second on the amendment to the amendment? Representative Washit, discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Discussion? All those in favor of the amendment to the amendment, please raise your hand. 
The amendment has been adopted. We're back on the amended amendment. <coughs> discussion, any further amendments? Any further discussion? Representative Yen. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I just wanted to offer an amendment and maybe this is worthwhile better as a separate motion, but um, I'll just move to amend before the word house after house committees on 2-2 house committees add membership to, so it would read membership to house standing committees shall be appointed by the Speaker of the House, just to resolve uh, Representative McGuire's ambiguity from earlier. So there's an amendment to the amendment it has nothing to do with the original amendment. Um, so it's membership to house. So inserting 2-2 um, two -two is currently reads house committees underlined period. And then we would insert membership to house standing committees. Is that the amendment? That is Mr. Speaker. All right, is there a second to the amendment? There's a second by Washington. All right, we're voting on any discussion on the amendment to the amendment, to the amended amendment. All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Thank you, all those opposed, amendment has been adopted. So we're back on the doubly amended amendment <coughs> to the house rules that will be amended. Further discussion on the amended amendment? Further discussion? Representative Washington. Just briefly, <clears throat> the comment about having the, the audit committee be more like rules that would only meet intermittently, because I'm really concerned about dividing 60 members among all these committees. Um, you know, we see you committee chairmen who are serving on other committees and uh, sometimes more than one committee. And uh, I, I just think the workload can pile up. So I think we have to be really judicious about uh, how often this audit committee would be meeting during the session and, and the workload that would go along with being part of that committee as well as all the other committees. Thank you for the discussion, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just to respond to that point um, to the Vice Chairman. So the, the committee is meeting in the interim and this is just so that they can have bills referred at the Speaker's discretion during while we're meeting. And I don't think it's gonna be many. So I, I, I think probably one to three per session, maybe even zero. Um, but it would, it would ha allow that discretion. And I think like the rules committee, I mean, you just work in that meeting um, around the committee schedule. I, I don't think it would be a big change. So um, thank you. Thank you. Representative Chairman Greer. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm gonna go ahead and vote for this, but I think we need to follow up with what Chairman Wilson was saying. I think we need to take a, a look. Um, if we're gonna add a 13th, um, committee, we uh, we may need to, but we, we need to take a much deeper dive on this. I think this is a step to push us in the direction of doing that deeper dive. Uh, everybody knows my feelings on select committees and task forces and everything else. If we if we need some expertise, uh, just go ahead and this this work towards that. And if that requires another standing committee, I'm I'm, I'm open to that. So I'm going to go ahead and vote for this just to move it forward. Try to try to stimulate that discussion. Further discussion, Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, should we treat this something like a skyscraper and not have a committee 13 and just go directly to committee 14? <laughs> well, somebody's got to be lucky. <laughs> lucky 13. Uh, all right. That was that an amendment to the amended amendment, doubly amended amendment. All right. Further discussion. Further discussion. Uh, Representative Summers. <coughs> Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and I totally agree that this needs to be an interim topic because I have the same concerns idea about a technology committee, but I'm not willing to do it now and I'm not going to vote for it now. But I do believe that we need to investigate whether we need another standing committee or not. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Further discussion. All right. All those in favor of the amended amendment, please raise your hand. 
One, two, three, four. All those opposed? Six. The amendment has failed. Thank you, Representative Gray. Um, the next amendment is, uh, and I think I only have one left. Does anybody have anything else? All right, Majority Floor Leader Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And does, does everybody have my amendment? And, and so, Mr. Chairman, and if you look at the strikeout version that I have, so you see that I'm crossing out the existing um, 4-5, which is the introduction deadline, which currently says no bill other than general appropriations bills shall be introduced after noon of the 15th legislative working day of the session, except by consent of two thirds of the elected members, bills that have been signed, submitted and accepted by the legislative service office prior to the 12th, 12th, 12 noon cutoff date for consideration of bills are still at the printer's office will be considered as being within the cutoff deadline. Such a list of bills will be delivered by the LSO to the speaker of the, at the cutoff hour. And so in the past, I know this has prompted us having a schedule that actually included an inter, you know, an, uh, a numbered bill schedule. In other words, we had a deadline for a numbered bill and then a deadline for introduction, but even though that really wasn't in rule. And so really this is what I'm trying to do. And I think if I get Matt Obrick to make sure I say this correctly, so and what I do is go in and bifurcate and say no bill will be accepted for consideration except by consent of two thirds of the House members after 12 o'clock noon of the 12th legislative working day of the session. And then bills that have go on down through that whole list. And then subsection B, no bill shall be considered for introduction except by consent of two thirds of the House members after the six o'clock PM, the 14th legislative working day of the session. And so I actually reduce it by one just because kind of the schedule this year, that, that could be 15, but the idea is really to bifurcate. So we have bills can be numbered to a certain day and then the speaker has a little bit longer period of time to actually get them introduced. And so it's not, it's not pressing them as much. It does put the cutoff quicker, 12 instead of 15, but it, it just kind of bifurcates that. So that's, that's the amendment. And, um, and if, if Director Obrick would kind of talk it's talk about this. It seems like in the current existing, um, in the current existing rule, it's, it's confusing. And uh, him and I went through that, but it's now 822 at night and I'm confused. So if Director Obrick, if you could help me out, the kind of the confusion that exists in current, in the current form. Director Obrick, if you want to provide some clarity for our our good majority floor leader and maybe the rest of us. I'll, I'll do my best, Mr. Chairman. So existing rule 4-5 uh, says no bill other than general appropriations bills shall be introduced after noon of the 15th working day of the session. So um, you know, what, what we've read that to uh, mean, Mr. Chairman, is it actually can't be uh, proposed and, and introduced by the presiding officer. It's not a drafting deadline or it's not a numbering deadline. Um, that is actually contained a, a good example of, of what we're setting up or what Representative Summers is proposing in the new rule 4-5 is what the House has for a uh, budget bill uh, cutoff, numbering cutoff and introduction cutoff. You've got two different things in, in House Rule 13-2. See, no bill will be accepted for consideration. So that means no bill will be numbered by the House um, except by consent of two thirds votes um, of the House members afternoon on the third legislative day of the budget session. That's an A and the 13-2B says no bill shall be considered for introduction after six o'clock the fifth legislative day of the session. So what we're, what Representative Summers is proposing is a cutoff to say, hey, you can't get a bill numbered and placed on the LSO website um, except by two thirds vote afternoon on the 12th legislative day. And that no bill can be considered uh, for introduction 
by the House after the 14th day, except by two thirds vote. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, have any questions? Representative? Oh, thank you. Greg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, so this year, what will be the numbering deadline? Will it be the 12th day, the 13th day, the 14th day? Currently, it's, I guess, not in rule. So what, what day is the numbering deadline if this does not pass? Uh, Director Obrick, I, I, we've had this discussion. It's usually, they've tried to have three days prior, and that's just been a session schedule adoption. Um, that the Senate actually has a hard date in their rules, and we do not. Is that accurate, Matt, uh, represent, uh, Director Obrick? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think actually the Senate rule for their uh, general session is almost identical to the House's. It just provides that no bill will be introduced except after the 12th day. But you're, you're right in that the Senate budget bill language is the same as the House's um, or, or budget session language. Um, and, and you're also correct that we usually put that numbering deadline uh, to get those bills into LSO in their final form um, 72 hours before this introductory deadline. Follow up, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the bottom line is besides making this clear, there's no substantive change in A because it's the 12th legislative working day when bills need to be numbered anyway. And in B, the only change is that it's the 14th day rather than the 15th day. But other than that, it's just making it clear other than that 14th versus 15th in, in B, correct? I, um, I, I, Representative Summers, is that, was that your intent? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you, it is. And it just happened to be the way our schedule this year works out if, and if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Director Obrick, then that the fifteenth day would occur on a Monday, the fourteenth day was on a Friday. Is that correct? And so it was just I thought since we're doing it for what's coming before us, I thought why well, have a whole nother weekend, you know, before that happens. But I'm comfortable going to 15, 12, and fifteen. I just think it needs to be in rule what we're what our practice is, so it's clear to everybody. Representative Gray, thank you, Representative Gray. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So now I want to go on a little bit of a different direction about this session because I mean, I'm trying to think about this now, whether it's 15 or 14. I mean, you know, we've got what 81 bills right now. I, I talked to the speaker today. I, I think he's going to refer us a, a number of the individual bills next week. Excuse me if I'm, I'm speaking, you know, in, in, out of turn here, Mr. Speaker, but so we're going to come in, we're going to have this deadline either on day 14, day 15, if we don't change it back, because actually I, I my thrust here is I think we might actually want to look at changing this back a little bit. I mean, are, are we going to come in and have like 150 bills numbered and he's going to refer the first day when we're back March one, like 80 to 90 bills to committees in one day. And that's going to happen successively like day two, day three, it'll be another 50, 60. Anyway, I I'm just trying to think about this and I, I think we're a little too crunched because of, of the bifurcated way we're doing this session and, I'm not sure it's going to work. So I, <laughs> is LSO concerned at all about this? Because I, I think, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, if anything, I think we might want to look at moving this back and if the session's going to work or am I overthinking this? Um, so I, I first want to be clear. What do you mean by moving it back? Meaning later into the, later into March or earlier? Well, I, I'm just trying to think of the, Mr. Speaker, sorry, I wasn't recognized. Go ahead, please. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, I'm just trying to think of the load on committees. Usually it's a little more staggered because we, we have two and a half weeks, but now we're going to have this deadline because we're doing eight days virtually. We're going to have this deadline for introduction, and we have the, the ninth day that was the 12th, right? So we're going to have this deadline six days after with hundreds of bills being filed. I don't know. It's just to me, I'm I'm concerned about the way that looks. I I don't think it. I, I I'm not sure it works. 
is, is my issue. If anything, I will want to keep it the same. I definitely don't want to make it 14 because I think uh, we're already going to be crunched. All right. Um, further discussion? Further discussion. Uh, I see Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So is the intent for this to just be for this year and then after that, they'll either it'll revert back to the current rule or it'll be changed forever? Um, I think, uh, Representative, just by the way I read the language, it's just during the 2021 general session. The way it's currently drafted is just for this session. So the successive legislature would have to amend this. Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, that's correct. And you know what, originally when I started, I was worried, um, I was thinking about making it more like our budget session because I was worried that we were gonna have so many bills with this extra time that, that it would be just a rush. But um, the, the good director said, no, that's really not a problem. And then we got to talking about kind of this inconsistency in our practice versus what we what we actually do and so so this is what I ended up proposing is is uh, we number it by the 12th 12th day and uh, an introduction by the 14th day thank you all right any further discussion further discussion further discussion committee what's your pleasure What's your point? I'll move the bill or move the rule. But. Thank you for moving your own. There's a second by Wilson. Summers Wilson. All right. Uh, I see a hand up and I see a I heard question. So Representative Gray, you have a discussion on the bill on the amend, on the motion. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to make an amendment. Is, is that okay? Please, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would like to amend B four five B and uh, and strike fourteenth in the third line of four four dash five B and and replace it with fifteenth. Okay. Is there a second? Is there a second? Is there a second to the motion? Second by Wilson. <clears throat> Discussion on the amendment. Session on the amendment to the amendment. Seeing none. Oh, sorry, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I I think in this unique session we should leave a little more time to introduce bills. I mean, we're gonna have as it is like probably 70 introductions those first few days. I mean, I I'm just not sure how this is totally gonna work. Um, and I think we should lean on the side of caution. I mean, anything possibly move it back, but but I wouldn't move it up a day. I wouldn't do that. I think we should just make it 15th. Okay, thank you for the discussion. For the discussion, all those in favor of the amendment to the amendment, please raise your hand. <coughs> thank you, all those opposed. The amendment has failed. We're back on the amendment as unamended. <coughs> Further discussion on the amendment? So I'm gonna propose an amendment just because it's the last one of the day. And I'm gonna strike um, the words during the 2021 general session. I'm gonna strike the, so this will be, um, So this would be applicable for future legislators, uh, uh, legislate, legislatures without them having to re, uh, amend their rules automatically. Um, so that's my motion. Uh, is there a second to the motion? If there's not a second, then we'll, we'll let it die. There's a second by Greer, discussion on the amendment. Yeah, Representative Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. You know, I think if you want to be consistent and you want to do this, then I think you should take uh, Representative Gray's motion on the 15th. If you want to make this permanent, then I think you do what's more consistent with what our practice has been, 
which would be get rid of 2021 general session and increase that 14 to 15. And, and then I think it's, it's more consistent with what we've done. And, uh, you know, I can't, I, I guess, I guess I can, I'm going to make that, that motion. I mean, we had a motion on the floor, you had an amendment. I'm going to further amend, uh, or I would like to move a further amendment of your amendment. It's a friendly, just, it's a friendly addition. I'll just say that. Friendly addition. <laughs> okay. And the second agrees to it. <laughs> All right. And so I'll speak to the amendment um, and my amendment and, and the 15th, I think has been spoken to. All I want to do is not make, make it so the next legislature actually has to go in, repeal this, and do something. That's all I'm trying to do because the way it currently read, reads is this would only be applicable during the 2021 general session. The current, the current rule as it is applies to all the session, both sessions, both the, the special session and the, um, excuse me, both the general session and the budget session. At least that's the way I read it. Director Obrick, is that incorrect with the current rule 4-5? Mr. Chairman, I, uh, the bill introduction deadline during a budget session is covered by rule 13-2. Okay. Thank you. So I guess my, my bigger thing is I, I just wanted to, so the next legislature doesn't have to come in and actually deal with this um, because we didn't do it. So Director Obrecht, does that strikeout accomplish what I'm trying to get done? Mr. Chairman, it certainly does. Okay, further discussion on the amended amendment to the amended amendment. <coughs> For, <laughs> Representative Conley, do you have a question? No, okay. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. All those opposed? So the amendment has been amended. We're back on the amendment. Any discussion? Any discussion? Representative McGuire. Just because I can see that uh, Chairman Greer is kind of getting into this, I'm going to suggest an amendment here. And that would be on the, the seventh line of paragraph A. And that would be so that the uh, sentence would read something to the effect of uh, submitted and accepted by the Legislative Service Office prior to the 12 noon cutoff date for consideration of bills and then strike but are still at the printer's office. And the reason being is who knows if we're even gonna start keep printing bills. I mean, we may just, everything may be electronic in the future. So I would just say that uh, if we want to make this a forward looking bill, uh, if it's been accepted by the LSO prior to the 12 noon cutoff, you're good. There's a second by Summers. So we have an amended amendment to the amendment to the amendment Further discussion on the amendment, striking the printer off. Here we are trying to add jobs in the state of Wyoming, and now we're getting rid of the discussion. Further discussion. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. All those opposed, amendment has been adopted. We're back on the amended amendment. Further discussion. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Now we're on the we're on the entire amendment now. Thank you. All those opposed? Amendment has been adopted. Any further business for the committee? Further business for the committee. Madam Secretary, anything for the committee? I think uh, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know everybody's been a long day, but uh, what is the procedure for if an amendment did not did not pass for it to be submitted for consideration tomorrow? If it did not pass as, as being uh, approved by the Rules Committee? Thank you. So I think that the Rules Committee will bring forth the consolidated amendment. And then that is, of course, divisible if folks want to divide one out. Anything that was not recommended, um, is it standard practice to at least let the body know what was not recommended? Um, Director Obrecht, or we just take amendments from the floor in that capacity? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, standard practice is just to take amendments from the floor. So Representative Gray, if um, if you wanted to submit an amendment um, tomorrow during the rules, get it to LSO and we'll get it uh, posted 
to the website for consideration. And that would, that, and we'll do rules consideration for house rules, well, for house rules on Monday, next Monday. All right, so tomorrow, are there any proposed, um, do any of the house members have anything proposed for joint rules? Have there been any joint rules proposed, Director Obrecht, that you know of for consideration tomorrow during our joint rules committee? Mr. Chairman, I think you will have one joint rule for consideration um, uh, that the Senate is proposing tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Further business? Further business? Mr. Chairman. Rules? Uh, yes. Mr. Chairman, just thank, uh, I want to just thank you and Rep. Chairman Greer for uh, your hard work at the mics today. So thank you. Yeah, just drag it out a little longer. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Director. Thank you, Pam. I don't know if the Chief Clerk's still here. Mr. Speaker. Speaker uh, Archman, you got some final business you want to help us with? I already went on a date, came back, and I just wanted to thank you all for your hard work. The hardest working house in America, man. Look at our staff and all you guys there. Great job. So appreciate yeah. you. Go ahead, Greer. I know what you're going to say, Representative Greer. Go ahead. No, you, you don't. Okay. You don't. I. Uh, you guys are awesome. I No, I mean, honestly, I want like a gold star or something because – uh, the patience that I showed today was remarkable. Uh, is and and uh, Representative McGuire took every ounce of my body and I had to gavel you down when you were doing your privilege of the floor, my friend. When was I doing a privilege of the floor, Representative McGuire? Oh, maybe there oh, yeah. maybe there'll be a gift of rye whiskey at some point, Representative right. Greer. I think we've uh, strayed from our business. The public is probably you, wondering guys. what we're doing. Uh, thank you. Chief Clerk, anything for us? All right. Thank you, Chief Clerk. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Director. Um, thank you, Speaker Harshman, for tearing yourself away from your date night. 